just before the outbreak of the war, I had come to know rather intimately a very prominent English gentleman, a member of the House of Commons, a member of the Cabinet, formerly one of the justices of the Supreme Court of Britain, the author of many of the books which we in Canada studied while we were preparing for law. He said, first, I'd like to say to you that you have said to me a time or two that you believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. You have said to me that you think that Jesus of Nazareth and God the Father appeared to Joseph Smith. Now, he said to me, that's fantastic. He said, the thing I'm troubled about is a man trained in logic and evidence could give himself over to such palpably absurd ideas. And I said, of course, I am proceeding on the assumption that you are a Christian. Certainly, I assume you believe the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, to be the word of God. I do. You believe what's written in the book? Certainly, yes. You say that my statement that God spoke to a man in this age is fantastic and absurd. To me, it is. Do you believe that God ever did speak to anyone? Well, certainly, all through the Bible we have evidence of that. Did he speak to Adam? Yes. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Joseph, and on through the prophets. I believe he spoke to every one of them. Do you believe that that kind of contact between God and man ceased at the meridian of time or when Jesus appeared? No, he said it reached its climax, its apex on that occasion. Do you believe that God spoke through Jesus? Yes. Was he the son of God? He was. Do you believe, sir, that after Jesus was resurrected, and after he ascended into heaven, and I assume you think he did ascend into heaven, I do, do you believe that a certain lawyer by the name of Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, contacted that very individual, namely Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified and had ascended into heaven? Do you believe that Saul saw light and heard a voice? I do. Whose voice was it? It was the voice of Jesus Christ, for he so introduced himself. Then, my lord, and that's the way we speak to justices in the British Empire, my lord, I am submitting to you in all seriousness that it is, has been standard procedure throughout all recorded time for God to talk to men. He says, I think I'll have to admit that, except that it stopped shortly after the first century of the Christian era. Why did it stop? I can't say. You think that God hasn't spoken since then? I'm sure he hasn't. There must be a reason. Can you give me a reason? I do not know. May I suggest a reason or several? Perhaps God does not speak to men anymore because he can't. He's lost the power. He said, of course, that would be blasphemous. Well, then, if you don't accept that, perhaps he doesn't speak to men anymore because he doesn't love us anymore. He's gone off and left us to find our own way in the dark. Well, he said, God loves all men of all ages and is no respecter of persons. Well, then, if he could speak, if he loves us, then the only other possible answer, as I see it, is that we don't need him. We've made such rapid strides, we're so well educated, we have such great science, we don't need God anymore. And then he said, and his eyes were moist when he said it, Mr. Brown, there never was an age in the history of the world, there never was a people or a time when the voice of God was needed as is needed now. And then he said, can you tell me why he doesn't speak? And my answer was, my Lord, he does. He has spoken. He is now speaking. 
And all we need is the faith to hear him.